Our last video was about setting up network. This video is going to use those networks to connect to storage. Storage in a clustered Hyper-V environment must be shared so that all the nodes can access it. We're going to spend some time in later videos going over storage options. If you haven't designed your storage yet, that's okay. This video is just a how-to on connecting to the various types. There are two basic ways this is done. The first method is SMB. This is the same Windows share that we've had available to us for years. It uses the familiar UNC format of a double backslash, server name, single backslash, share name. We're going to dedicate an entire video to this topic later. For now, the important thing to know is that you don't go through any steps on a Hyper-V host to set up a persistent connection to an SMB share. It must be reachable from all the hosts, and that is the only requirement. It's not necessary to register the location in Hyper-V or the cluster. The next method involves connections to block-level storage. This can be exposed to nodes by a direct serial attached SCSI connection, known as SAS, by Fiber Channel, or by iSCSI. For SAS or Fiber Channel, you'll have to follow your hardware vendor's instructions to make the connection. If they don't provide instructions specifically for Hyper-V, Find out if they have connection methods for Windows Server Core, as they should be interchangeable. However you connect, the important thing to remember is that each node must have its own connection. We'll look at how to make an iSCSI connection, since that's more universal. But if you're using SAS or Fiber Channel, you'll want to keep listening, as there is more to storage than just the connection. To connect to iSCSI, you can use either the GUI or PowerShell. We'll start with the GUI. At the command line, type iSCSICPL.exe and press enter. If you've never done that before, you'll be presented with this box that asks if you want to start the service. We do, so we'll answer yes. First, we need to switch to the Discovery tab. Click the Discover Portal button. Enter in the IP address or the DNS name of your iSCSI system's portal. If its portal has any security options, you'll need to click the Advanced button to enter those. You can also enter a specific source host from your connecting host, if you like. Since the portal in this configuration appears on two IPs, we'll go ahead and enter that as well. Now, we go back to the Target tab. When we press Refresh, the entered portals will be scanned and available targets will appear. To connect, we could just highlight one and press Connect. Unfortunately, since we have multiple paths available, we don't know what it will pick. Instead, we'll click Properties and Add Session. Leave the Favorites box selected so that it's reconnected each time the server starts. Since we have two network connections to storage, we'll select Enable Multipath. Then we'll click Advanced and manually select the IP pairs that we want. This is also where we'd enter any necessary security information. The Favorites tab shows connections that were saved for subsequent reboots. You can see details of a connection like this. This can all be done in PowerShell. First, we start the iSCSI service and set it to Auto Start. There are parameters available for the different security settings if you need to set those. List available targets. You can get a clearer view of the target names like this. We connect by piping the output of get iSCSI target to the connect iSCSI target commandlet. What we'll do is have it scan for the iSCSI sessions we just made and register those. We could have skipped the WHERE portion and it would have registered all active sessions, but we already put some in favorites from the GUI and we don't want to repeat those. Now that we're connected to storage, we want to make multipath work. 
These nodes use two network paths to reach iSCSI storage. Many SAS and fiber channel adapters also have two or more connections. In order to use them all simultaneously, we need to enable a Windows feature called Multipath I.O. If we don't, then the connected lines will show up twice, but only one will work, and we'll get errors when we try to validate our storage. As you can see, we need to restart. Before we do that, let's enable the default MPIO mode so we don't have to reconfigure anything later. You can research LQD and the other available options in the help system. Now, we need to let MPIO claim the iSCSI disks. This system uses iSCSI, so we'll select that. The other option is SAS if you're using those. And now we have to restart to proceed. While this node is rebooting, perform all the same steps on other nodes to connect to all LUNs that will be used in your cluster. Once the system comes back, we can format our disks. This part must only ever be done on one node. Never bring a disk online on more than one Windows system at a time. The process is the same for SAS, iSCSI, and Fiber Channel Connected Storage. Now, we could do all this remotely with Server Manager just like any other disk, but for this video, we'll do it locally in PowerShell. Use Git Disk to look at them. We'll work with Disk 1. Bring it online. Initialize it. Create a partition. And finally, format it. And that's it. Now when the cluster is created, it will see this disk and automatically add it to cluster storage. Repeat for all your other disks. Now our network and our storage is all prepared. We're ready to jump into cluster validation in the next video.